Hybrid Cloud Show, Episode 3. I'm Aaron. I'm Gary. I'm Sean. And I'm Shane. Welcome to the show about public cloud, private cloud, and everything in between. Our views are ours, and not those of our employers. So starting out, just some quick feedback we had from the last episode about Ubuntu and updates. People are absolutely right. Out of the box, Ubuntu does have unattended upgrades turned on, and it will keep you up to date with security updates. The point I was making there was more around balancing that with stability. I actually did a blog series on this, so I will drop the note for those interested people who contacted us into the show notes, and they can read up at their pleasure. So we're going to go into a discussion today on hybrid cloud and what that means to us. We've talked a bit so far about public clouds, and it's about time we balanced it out with a broader discussion on hybrid. So first up, I just wanted to know what hybrid cloud means to all of you. I'm very proud of us. It took us three episodes to talk about the name of our show. I'm very excited. Hybrid cloud to me is about choosing the right place for your workloads. And that's it. It's about securing what you need to secure and then leveraging all the benefits of the public cloud. And there's a whole science behind it, apparently. I think for me, it's about making sure, and similar to you, Sean, that the right parts of the workload are running in the right place. And that might be for cost reasons. That might be for efficiency reasons. That might be for regulatory reasons. There's a whole bunch of reasons that you might do it. But for me, There are a whole bunch of advantages and disadvantages to cloud versus on-prem and put the right part of the workload in the right place. It feels like a very vague and broad definition to some extent. There's multi-cloud, there's public-private, there's on-prem. It's kind of a bit of everything, really. It's interesting, isn't it? I remember seeing something that talked through the broad philosophy that you should have your committed workloads effectively satisfied by a private cloud where you could buy that, right? And I think in the public cloud world, we largely see that with things like reserved instances and and those sorts of technologies. But if you put your effectively your committed use into the private cloud and you can buy and pay for that, then it does give you that opportunity to burst in theory into the public cloud for the workload that you don't have sitting there in your data center ready to use. But in practice, how have you found the use of I've hybrid cloud out in the wild? What, what are the challenges people normally face when they're trying to make this work? I think orchestration is a big one. If you've got a bunch of legacy applications that sit on premises that you've had there for years, what I tend to see is that people leave those legacy applications sitting on VMware or whatever it might be on premises. And then as they're building and deploying new stuff, they put that on cloud. And quite often the challenge they have there is how do I orchestrate in a way that allows me to run those new applications, both in my private cloud and across multiple public clouds where it makes sense. Where do you think it works particularly well? What sort of applications can split across private clouds and public clouds in the same sort of application? Is that really something people do? I think there's a bunch of utility for it in things like regulated industry. Say, if you think about something like the gambling industry, where there are different regulators in the US, you know, there are a different regulator for each state, and they all have slightly different rules on where you can run certain parts of the workload. Some of them want any player data for those people playing their games to be kept in state and therefore you've got to keep something like your database in a state and your public cloud provider might not have a region in that state or might not have a presence in that state and therefore you keep it there but you probably don't want to put the really scalable part of the workload like the actual front end for the games in a private cloud because that's really difficult to scale sometimes so stick the front end bit there put some kind of caching layer in between is a pretty common use case. So yeah, I think regulated stuff is somewhere where it really, really makes a lot of sense. And I think in the old world, there was always that, you know, there was that rack of servers sitting in in your office that you had to to have the kind of office related applications. But I'm seeing that less and less. What's What's your experience? I think that the event in 2020 massively changed that, to be honest with you. (laughs) No one wanted to have to be on a VPN to their office's network connection, which may or may have not been a particularly good network connection, right, to access those resources. So I think there we saw mass adoption of cloud services like Google Apps or Office 365, where people could access those things. And more and more, people don't want to have to deal with that stuff, right? Like... 
I don't want to have to run LDAP or Active Directory or one of those things if I can really help it. I'll tell you what, Azure AD is one of Microsoft's best products. And that's a very common use case for something like hybrid cloud. You have something on on-prem still, but you want to start moving, move your AD center off. That's a great way to start saving money and start leveraging the cloud. Is there a difference between the kinds of things, that the different infrastructure technologies that you would expect to see working in hybrid versus public cloud? Like, if is it containers that you would say are more in the cloud? Is it ISVMs or, or more at the application level that, that you think we would span across hybrid environments? Where to start with that one? Yes, yes to all. <laughs> So there are some software as a service companies out there that will give you something that you can run on your on-prem. They also have their hosted version and they can talk to each other. There's platforms as a service like Google Anthos and Azure Stack where you can run like your own Kubernetes on your own machine, but then it's wired up to, you know, talk back to something like GKE really, really easily. AWS Outpost even has hardware that they will come in and install for you, I believe. And then yeah, talks right to your stuff in, in AWS. And then of course, there's the, the infrastructure as a service, which is more of like the public clouds. You might be able to also say like VMware and like OpenShift also fall into that category. That to me is always the big challenge when you're talking about hybrid cloud is where does the control plane live? It's not easy. And it depends on what technology you're using. Because like if you are doing all Kubernetes, then you can maybe leverage something like Crossplane but then you have to have a Kubernetes cluster just to spin up cross-plane to then manage your other Kubernetes cluster and you might run into like a chicken and egg scenario. A question I kind of had was, I know we talk about predictable workloads being cheaper on-prem. The, the complexity overhead and the cognitive load cost to engineers perhaps working in that, is that something considered? Like, is, is, is this hybrid cloud model like transparent to the engineer? They don't even know whether they're talking to something on-prem or in the cloud, or is it a painful thing to operate on? So I think that you sort of get around that by selecting services that are what I would call the lowest common denominator between all of those things. So you're probably not going to start spinning up like a function as a service, right, if you're running a hybrid workload. But containers, as we've spoken a lot about, are a really good fit for that. And things that can abstract that stuff away from developers. So I spent a quite a while, a couple of years ago, working with Red Hat OpenShift. And that's a really good way to abstract these things away, right, because it's almost a platform as a service in a box where a developer can say, I want Redis or I want MongoDB and it has the built-in plumbing to spin up a templated MongoDB or a templated Redis that meets your company's requirements and they don't even have to care where that's running, right? It's running inside OpenShift, which behind the scenes is just a Kubernetes cluster running Podman and it doesn't matter where the worker node sits. So I think you abstract it away with choosing services that are going to work across on-prem or AWS or GCP or Azure or wherever it is that the application is going to run. I think if you want developers to care about it, which it sounds like you probably don't want developers to have to care about it, then you use technologies that are going to be API compatible across the clouds, right? So if you're thinking about a database, if you're talking Postgres to a database, you don't have to care whether it's RDS or a managed DB on Azure or some kind of serverless database like Aurora you're just giving the developer a Postgres connection string. They're connecting to it and they're doing inserts and whatever it is to the database. But it's tricky because sometimes your developers do care about that and you have to give them some sort of control to choose where that workload runs. And it's where you draw the line, right? In some cases, like in your organization, Shane, there's a platform engineering function that worries about that stuff for developers, by and large. Yeah. Whereas in other organizations, you've got a full stack developer who has to actually care about what the infrastructure is sitting on. I suppose this is complicating the world of the platform engineers trying to abstract away multiple cloud providers or an on-prem solution to their engineers. Does that cost come into it? I think it's something that you have to consider for sure. And the problem is, of course, that there's very few neutral players in, in this. And so you tend to see arguments along the lines that it sounds like you're suggesting that actually when you dig into it, there's a lot of hidden costs in running a data center as well as, as hidden costs in using the clouds. And there are amazing tools in tracking. We were, we were looking at some of those earlier today where 
the ways that you can break down spend on some of these cloud platforms is the sort of accountant's dream where they can attribute your you know your your different applications to different resources and things that's that's great and that can be really hard i think in the on prem world where you might be cheaper but it's it's a bit harder to allocate costs to different places unless you do a lot of work on that we talked about regulatory requirements so there's a tool in aws called aws config that I use a lot to understand some of the compliance requirements my organization has. It will apply this AWS config rule onto something like an S3 bucket to say, does this S3 bucket have certain logging enabled, we'll say. And I can I can run that everywhere and I can very easily spin it out so I can get a very good view of the regulatory status of my organization. And this is one example in a, in a on-prem slash cloud environment. Are things like that much more complicated? Are you basically duplicating solutions to kind of meet the same need? There are a bunch of solutions that will look across multiple clouds to do this stuff. So Wiz is one that springs to mind that's pretty good at not only looking across multiple clouds and seeing which security rules are you breaking or which policies have you put in place that you know, are being not adhered to by developers or by builders in the organization. It also has some really cool stuff where it will say, do you know what? You've got a load of security groups that have RDP open to the internet, but there's no transit gateway in that VPC. So actually, you don't need to worry about it because it's mitigated by something else. So there are tools that do it. But again, it's kind of a hidden cost, right? Because it's a piece of tooling that you're having to pay for that something like one of the native cloud tools that the cloud provider gives you for free would already do. The clouds aren't charities either, right? They know that capturing you in the control plane is going to mean that, that you will do more business there. So I think that's exactly why we're in this place is that actually there are some great tools and many of them are very well integrated into the platforms on the big cloud players to do all of these really important enterprise things. Because if you've got 90% of your workloads on the cloud and it's really easy to do all of your compliance requirements, then the incentive is always there to put the rest of it in those public clouds as well. So I think you're absolutely right. This is a challenge. And if you do it yourself, then then that is a way of giving you that independence as well from the cloud provider and lets you use your own infrastructure if you want to. But what I would say is that there's a whole industry that exists around this stuff, right, in abstracting certain parts of those workloads away from cloud providers. And a lot of people use them anyway. Datadog is one that springs to mind. Splunk is another one. There are customers that are happily all in on one cloud vendor, but they use Datadog for their logging and metrics because they like the way Datadog works. They use Splunk for their seam because they like the way that Splunk works. So Although these things do exist, they don't exist in a vacuum. They're not just for people running hybrid cloud stuff. They're pretty widely used across the industry anyway. There are also technologies like, I mean, Juju springs to mind in the in the Ubuntu world where you have the idea from the very beginning that you're going to abstract the concepts away and you're going to have the idea of an application that kind of lives independently of where it lives. And it just sort of depends on how you want to architect your solutions. and. It's been said before, but if you've got clean kind of boundaries like containers, it makes an awful lot easier to pick those up and move them around. And as Gary said, you know, there's a there's an industry of, of platform technologies as well, like Red Hat OpenShift, where you effectively trade being in one cloud provider for being in one platform across whichever cloud provider you're going to use. And I think a strong counter argument to actually making use of some of the cloud native services, even when you want to be hybrid anyway is what's the proprietary bit that's important to your company? It's probably not the orchestration of that workload. It's probably the code that your developers have put time and resource into writing. So if you've got a Python function that spins up in Lambda and does something and then writes the result out to a database table somewhere, the bit that you probably care about is the Python, not the Lambda bit. So you you could probably take that Python and without too much work, have it running in some Azure serverless function or something else. We've talked a lot about containers. How do you do that in a hybrid cloud way? Are you going to stretch your Kubernetes clusters across multiple providers, or would you always have a separate Kubernetes environment in each of your platforms? I would lean towards 
probably having separate Kubernetes clusters in each of the cloud platforms, just because stretching that control plane comes with its own set of risks, in my opinion. The other thing is that there are also a bunch of players in that space that specialize in spinning up standardized Kubernetes deployments across the multiple clouds. Rancher is one of those, right, where you effectively have a Rancher Kubernetes cluster and then you use that to orchestrate the Kubernetes clusters in other AWS accounts or other clouds. And that's a really popular way to do it. And then I think once you've done that, you just split the parts of the workloads out that make sense. I wouldn't be trying to do things like node taints or node selectors across <laughs> different cloud providers because it just feels to me like you're then putting all of your eggs in this collective shared control plane basket. And if there's an outage somewhere, then it's going to give you a headache. Additionally, you don't even have to split the workloads if you don't want to because there's a whole entire other section of the industry that specializes in networking, both within a Kubernetes cluster, but also between Kubernetes clusters. And so you can have one workload in one cloud, talk to your on-prem, talk to another cloud seamlessly. And yeah, Slack have got Nebula, right, which was built exactly for this, allowing them to have a transparent network across multiple clouds, and they can just run the workload wherever they want. And means that I can talk to my basement backup box. So snaps to Nebula. <laughs> <laughs> I guess question I have to the group is it sounds like Kubernetes is the way to do hybrid cloud. Is that is that the case? Is there alternative solutions? Does it have to always be containers with running on big piles of Kubernetes clusters? No, it doesn't have to, but that's the standard now. Everyone is pushing things containers and even like OpenShift, which allows you to do VMs, it's actually spinning up a VM using Kubevert on a Kubernetes cluster. I think it really depends on the company. I think there are a lot of companies where they still have a lot of data centers and they move to the cloud by starting some new projects in the cloud. And so they have a bunch of things that they do in the data center and then they have some new things that they do in Azure and then they have some new things they do on Oracle Cloud and those are separate projects and they've made a decision to put them in different places. They don't try and do too much coordination between it, but it means they've got that sort of bargaining power between the providers that none of them can hold them over a barrel. And that's a sort of basic way of doing multi-cloud operations where none of it is too complicated. It's a short extension from what they were doing before in their data center with some of the flexibility of being able to spin up resource on demand. Kind of nearly a de-risking process that should one go down, we've got some skill or knowledge in the other and we're running active in something. Yeah, it's, that's probably quite sensible to start with. There's also things like VMware Cloud that do a lot of this stuff, right? For businesses that were running a lot of VMware on-premises, they've got a lot of expertise there. They just pay VMware for the VMware Cloud on their hyperscaler of choice and they just continue using the skill set that they've already got in VMware there. They can then start to learn some of the cloud native tooling like the VMware Terraform provider to spin up VMs in VMware on the cloud. And then as they get more comfortable, they can start to move some of those workloads out to a VM that's native to the cloud rather than something that's running in VMware. So there are also some of those nice bridge solutions, I think, that companies maybe use to migrate or to spin up workloads using technologies they already understand that are outside of their on-prem data centers. Yes, I've seen some companies that are using the move to public cloud to be the opportunity to sit down and reassess what they're doing with their infrastructure or their IT. And they start to implement some proper policies that they probably should have had all along, but it's too big a job to look at their existing data center estate and retrofit those good practices to their existing machines. And so moving to the public cloud becomes an opportunity to add the CIS compliance or to do things properly around the way that they're managing access to machines or those sorts of things. And then the expectation is that over time, they will transition more workloads that way and they will fix up some of their legacy security mistakes. I mean, you'd be really surprised at how many people just don't care about east-west firewalling on premises. But then when they move to the cloud, suddenly they've got a security group in front of every machine. And they suddenly have to think about, actually, yeah, what ports does my database server need to have <laughs> access to and from where? You would not believe how many hybrid clouds I've seen where it was somebody on-prem trying to move to cloud and they started it. 
And then they just never finished and they like where they're at and they're just going to stay hybrid cloud. Or they put like a Cisco NetScaler appliance or something in the cloud and then yeah. they're like, yeah, I understand how that works. It's like, but you don't really need to do that, do you? Time for some admin. So first of all, thank you to our existing PayPal supporters and patrons. If you want to support the show, you can do that at hybridcloudshow.com slash support. And because we're part of the Late Night Linux family, for various amounts, you can get an ad-free feed of either just this show or all the Late Night Linux family shows. And sometimes you get episodes early. As this is a new show, one of the most valuable things that you can do to help us out is to tell a friend or two what we're doing and that you like it and give them the link. Let them listen. If you have any questions or feedback, please do send them in to show at hybridcloudshow.com. So I'm going to call out the elephant in the room, which is container security. So the challenge with a container from my perspective is that a container brings with it a lot of distribution that everyone likes to conveniently forget about. So if you're running a container that's got a whole bunch of packages from a Linux distribution, then how do you make sure that the containers you're running are going to stay secure in production? And it's not just that container with those dependencies. It's pulling from something that's probably pulling from something else all the way up and what are all of those things installing? How do you get a good handle on that? It's all magic the way. So it's a very good question. So the question is, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the very beginning of when you have a Docker file and you're making your container and you have to know that you're going to choose a base image that is from a reputable source that will be kept up to date and is as minimized as possible to have the least amount of dependencies? Or we can go all the way to the end of when it's on your Kubernetes cluster in production, how do you continue to watch that and maintain that? Where do you want to start? I'm going to start at the Docker file and you're building your container piece. Because I think that that's the thing that people get wrong most often is the biggest piece of advice I got given when I started working with containers was trust upstream. And what I mean by that is you want a container with Nginx in it grab the upstream Nginx container from the Nginx project. Don't grab an Alpine image or an Ubuntu image and apt install Nginx, or worse, I've seen people build Nginx from source and then add the mod security modules in and end up with like a four gig container image at the end of it. Trust upstream is, I think, the easiest way to make sure that you're ruling out as many of those weird quirks that you might introduce or weird software supply chain things. Because If you don't trust upstream at the end of the day, you probably shouldn't be using that piece of software. I mean, I'm going to challenge you a little bit there. And I know that that's that's probably not that surprising. But I'm going to challenge you a little bit because I think Nginx is very good for, I'm not picking on Nginx, any of those application kind of containers are very good at making sure that their application works, right? And they're going to be very good at getting a container together that goes out the door and does what it's supposed to do. But they're not maintainers of all of their dependencies. They're not, they don't have the security teams watching all of the things that they're pulling into their package. So I sort of take your point, but you can either do that so that all of your packages that you're getting are coming from the upstream for from that package. But if you want to take a, a container that's a real unit that someone's made and tested, then who's the person you trust? Well, for me, I would worry about that at the next step, which is once you've built your thing and put it in a registry, have some kind of dependency scanning thing there that's looking at that. And OECR supports image scanning, which is quite helpful. Just it gives quite a nice red, amber, green for how healthy your containers are. And it can be quite scary if you look back at the old versions and how uh, out of date dependencies get and how um, critical it can be to keep an eye on these things. Yeah. And it can also integrate with like Amazon Inspector and things and start to apply your company's own security policies to those images that you've pushed. And maybe you've got a tolerance for a dependency being a minor version or two out of date and not flag it and things like that. So there is some pretty powerful stuff there that you can do once an image is built and pushed. One of the challenges I have to the always trusting upstream is sometimes they don't provide consistent base operating systems. So what you might have is a real estate where you're pulling from base upstream and it's all running Ubuntu and a couple are running Alpine or a couple are running Debian. And say so you need to install something across all of them. You've kind of complicated things for yourself a bit. I don't know about that. 
I think I'm going to push back on that one because while it's absolutely correct that different upstreams will have different base images, that's absolutely true. You should know what version you're you're working with, and even popular things like Nginx and I don't know Postgres, they have like different versions. Like they might be based on Debian, but there's like like a 14 dash Alpine tag, and that will pull an Alpine version. And so you probably can't get full consistency, but I think you can wiggle around some, tweak some things and get it to be a, a fairly consistent platform. Yeah, I think you can get fairly close. And I guess it also depends on like what you're using that base container image for. Are you using that just as a runtime to get a piece of your application running? Or are you using it for something like a database where you might care a little bit more and you might want to maybe add some kind of utility into that image or you know, some piece of security software into the image? Yes, the tough part, I think, is if you find a container that you're using in production and it is full of security vulnerabilities and the latest version that's available is also full of security vulnerabilities, what do you do then? Rely on other strategies in your stack. There's no just one one solution fits all. It's a combination of things to mitigate as much as you can. So just like Gary said, use the dependency scanners in your registry, use the AWS inspector. There's a, a bajillion tools out there, Trivi, even free stuff like Harbor comes with built-in dependency scanning. And then even when you're running production, make sure you have security, watching all your endpoints, make sure all your things are authenticated correctly, who are talking to them are authorized, you know, basic stuff you do with any workload, even if it was a container. Yes, I was being deliberately provocative there in the sense that I think a big difference in the world of containers from a virtual machine is that you can't just go in and do an apt upgrade and get your latest versions of your dependencies in the same way. I think you need to rebuild those containers often as well. Yes, and make sure to use tools, whether it's dependent bot or renovate to constantly watch for new upstream changes and rebuild constantly. That is absolutely sage advice, unless you care about the environment and all your stuff runs on CI CD. <laughs> <laughs> well, we better get out of here then. So thanks a lot for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. In the meantime, I've been Aaron. I've been Gary. I've been Sean. And I've been Shane. See you later.